Hello, and welcome to another episode of Balanced Body Radio. I'm your host, Casey Ruff, and today we have another amazing guest to introduce to you now. Dr. Scott Solomons has practiced general dentistry at Dental Associates of Connecticut since 1989, recently adding functional medicine to his practice. This is a new paradigm that ultimately enables the patient to heal by combining dentistry, nutrition, and general health concepts for better and longer lasting results. Dr. Solomons recently completed his studies in functional medicine at the Cresser Institute. He received his doctor of dental surgery at Columbia University School of Dental and Oral, Oral, Oral Surgery with a concentration in TMJ disorders. Dr. Solomons is a member of the Connecticut State Dental Association, the American Dental Association, the American Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry, the Paleo Physicians Network, Primal Docs, the International Academy of Biological Dentistry and Medicine, the Ancestral Health Society, and the Weston A. Price Foundation, among many others. And I do mean many others. I had to really vastly abbreviate that. It was pretty crazy. Uh, we just couldn't let this episode just be the introduction. He is also on the Medical Advisory Board of the Crestor Institute for Functional and Evolutionary Medicine. Dr. Scott Salomons, it's such an honor to welcome you to Balanced Body Radio. Casey, it's great to be here. Thanks for having us. And Donna Solomons, welcome as well. We didn't include you in the introduction, but uh, we're so glad that the better half could join. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm his biggest cheerleader. <laughs> well, that's great. We're so excited to have both of you on today. We have to talk right off the bat about um, Patrick Swayze and your <laughs> Patrick Swayze mullet. Fantastic. <laughs> You guys are like spitting image, like dirty dancing. Like you look exactly like him back in the day. It, it, you know, we, it, we actually got into some clubs that way too. And that's um, amazing. We were in Cannes and, and the paparazzi was yelling, Mr. Slizzy, Mr. Slizzy. <laughs> <laughs> you uh, can't make this stuff up. It's amazing. Yeah, Sorry. it's amazing. So Donna, this is a question for you. How high up on your priority list was the mullet? Was that like the, the number one thing you fell in love with? Was that like second or third? Um, you know, it was up there. I mean, I, I, you have to remember the time. Now it, it seems a little silly, but a good <laughs> mullet, I mean, it, it can make the look, you know. Business in front, party in the back. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I do have to give you credit, Scott. I, I messaged you as soon as I saw the picture. I'm like, that picture looks amazing. That is absolutely a hockey career wasted if you didn't play hockey. And yes. you play hockey. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And Beautiful. I understand you play as well. I do. I do. Not very well, but I play. Yeah. Same here. <laughs> I'm missing the hockey head. That's that's what I've, I've been missing all this time. <laughs> oh, that's great. I always get kicked out really watching the... Yeah, it is it's awesome. I always get a kick out of watching. Oh, nice. No, I, we can't. We're going to edit that out. I'm sorry. Just beat my pens last night in the Stanley Cup finals. Uh, exciting game, exciting series. But uh, yeah, that, we're going to edit all that out. Just kidding. <laughs> um, I always get a kick out of watching the um, Minnesota State High School tournament called Minnesota. All the, all the kids have their amazing, disgusting hair every year. And it's, it's awesome to see the highlights of that. Um, but we are here to talk about other things other than your amazing legendary mullet that you had back in the day. Um, I would love to hear a little bit about your story and how you got interested in dentistry and how that went for you. We talked about a lot of things in the introduction that I wouldn't expect to be talking to a dentist about. And I never certainly talked to any of my dentists about those things too. So really curious to hear about your story and how you got interested in what you did. Yeah, it's, it's probably a kind of a funny story, I guess, um, because I'm pretty sure I knew I was going to be a dentist in the middle of high school. Wow. And I, yeah. And I kept going, really? Can I be something cool like a junk bond trader? You know, some, <laughs> kept coming back to that. So, you know, I, I knew I kind of wanted to go into the health profession, but um, I wanted like a preventive type thing. And back then, at least at my age, like all the alternative modalities were not on my radar at all. So dentistry seemed like the most preventive one. And um, so, you know, that's that I set my goal on that. And um, sorry, just getting a phone call. I thought I had my phone silenced, but apparently it's connected to my. You're good. You're good. Anyway, um, so it, in college, I went to upstate New York in Binghamton, and they have a really good evolutionary studies uh, program there. So I took a ton of evolution, and I got this idea that we're cavemen and women kind of living in the wrong era. Genetically, we really haven't changed. 
So little did I know that was kind of the seed of, you know, the paleo movement, right? What did I know? This, um, this was occurring to you when you were in school? Yeah, this was wow. back in, you know, 80, 1980 to 84 was my dad. Wow, really, um, really. I really enjoyed it. And I was always curious to, you know, how the heck we got here. Um, but I, you know, went on to dental school after that. And I kind of had to put all that stuff in my back pocket. I mean, it was enough to, you know, survive dental school. And then um, I was always kind of sickly. Uh, I had colds all the time, sinus infections, cold sores, you name it. I was a runt. I was a little kid. I didn't even think I made five feet tall until I was in high school. I was lucky. To, I'm 5'8 now. I mean, I'm lucky that I scratched that one out. Um, but it was actually getting worse as I started practicing met Donna, had, you know, two wonderful kids they're 28 and 24 right now um but i was literally wondering whether i was going to have the uh health to support them it was getting bad um and then i eventually found that i had a, a gluten allergy so i couldn't eat wheat and then i thought well what else is there a bagel for right everybody that I know had a cereal, a bagel. It was the food pyramid. I thought we were supposed to do that. A sandwich for lunch, pizza, whatever it was. So this would have been probably like 15 years ago. It was a while ago now. So the only information that really that, that I had on it was Lauren Cordain's book, The Paleo Diet. Um, now that I know the history, he he kind of chickened out. He knew that fatty meat would have been the way to go, but he was afraid nobody would buy his book. So he didn't actually feature fatty meat in his book. And you kind of accidentally go low carb when you go paleo, if you don't know what you're doing, <laughs> you're not supposed to eat potatoes and all that stuff. So protein is a really bad energy source, is it not? So I think I had rabbit starvation for a while there. Wow. See lean meats and I, I wouldn't get in the car without a bag of nuts or something. I mean, wow. it, was, it was nutty. But, um, you know, I so I, I kind of embraced that whole thing. And I would talk to folks about it as a really, you know, an important part to eliminating uh, their own health issues, you know, just part of my practice. And um, I would go on the internet and search for a community and I really couldn't find one. And I sort of gave up. The only thing I could find years ago was something from Creighton University. They had a couple of pages on the paleo diet. That was it wow. as part of the course. It was really wild. But then um, one day I, um, I walked into the reception area and a patient jumped up and gave me a big hug and said, you saved my life. I said, what? And, um, you know, I had mentioned the paleo diet. He was on all kinds of medications and so forth, and he got off of everything. So I thought, wow, that's great. And then he started mentioning Mark's Daily Apple and Rob Wolf. And I said, what? So then I realized there was a community out there. Um, and then I just started embracing that and um, kind of came across a bunch of podcasts, uh, really admired like Rob Wolf, Mark Sisson, you know, the usuals. And oh, Chris, Chris Kresser. So um, I, I, I got into the whole functional medicine thing. That's kind of really, I think a functional medicine practitioner was the one that realized that I had a, a gluten allergy. So mm -hmm. I thought that was a cool thing because here I was really an average person. But when I look back, unhealthy my whole life, you know, we just take it for granted that we're going to have colds and this, that, and the other thing. And it's normal. We're just going to fall apart. And um, I've learned kind of otherwise. Uh, so with Chris Kresser, I knew it was Chris Kresser and Rob Wolf were both vying to kind of put together a functional medicine program uh, based on, you know, ancestral medicine. And uh, Chris won. So I signed up for, for Chris's thing. And I was in the first class. That was a while, six years ago, maybe by now. Wow. It feels like it's brand new, but it's it's been a while. So I encompass that into my practice, and um, I'm always looking for uh, better ways to to help people get healthy. Because if brushing twice a day, flossing once a day, and fluoride was the answer, boy, we're doing a bad job. There is so much decay out there, Casey. It ain't even funny. Wow. So it's a little bit more than that. 
So I brought in the conversation with my patients to encompass these sort of ancestral um, principles. Yeah. Wow. I'm so excited to unpack some of that with you. Um, Donna, I'm curious to know, did you experience the same thing kind of growing up before um, you guys were kind of changing your diet? Did you deal with a lot of the same things? Uh, I, I mean, I had issues. My issues were probably a little bit different than Scott. Um, I had a lot of breathing issues and um, I also was very, very small and uh, my nutrition was definitely, uh, you know, fro- I, I honestly don't think I ever saw a, um, fresh vegetable before I was in my twenties, I mean, frozen cans, um, you know, the kind of sugar cereals and things like that. So, but it was just what you knew. And, um, it was, you know, I hadn't made the connection between what I was putting in my body with how I was feeling. And, um, it, it was it was great to meet someone like Scott, who again is he's so open to learning and um, kind of exploring new new subjects and and making correlations. It was really helpful to me, absolutely. Yeah, that's great. Tell us a little bit about the current state of our teeth at this point. Um, you you talked about decay. It, um, is that just one of those things that so many people have it now? We just call it normal when it's not normal. It's just average. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think the statistics are, it seems more from what I see, but I think officially they claim that under 65, 91% of us have had tooth decay. Wow. That's a high number, but it seems closer to 100%. It's extremely rare, rare that I see somebody who hasn't had decay. And then as we get older, um, the health kind of fails, the mouth dries a little bit, and then I think it goes up to 97%. But, um, you know, when they look at ancient skulls, they don't find any tooth decay until we started farming. So sugar gets the blame, Casey, but it's really any carbs that are liberated from the cell of a, of a plant. I, I call it dense acellular carbohydrate. And they find tons of decay. I mean, the Egyptians, um, they were small, they had pot bellies, they literally had man boobs, they had awful teeth. And, you know, they, they were all mummified. So they break them out all the time and take MRIs and do all kinds of stuff. And um, they had cardiac calcification, they had heart disease. So they basically had, a, I'm going to guess, a similar diet to what we have now, a grain-based, probably low protein type of diet it didn't serve them well and i don't feel that it serves most people that well not that i'm very dogmatic with how people eat but there are certain basic principles that i think are important in nutrition so there there's plenty of tooth decay uh in people that eat wheat barley and all that other stuff and then i love the one example I think it was in Morocco, they found a 14,000 year old, I think it was a cave and the teeth were awful, but this would have been before farming. And how did this happen? It looks like they were somehow processing acorns, water, pestle, whatever, and really refining them to the point where they had awful, awful teeth. Wow. Well, I find that very interesting that that's an exception to the sort of this, you know, the paleo diet, because it was the paleolithic era. So with uh, basic tools, apparently we, we still had the ability to highly process foods and liberate the carbohydrates from inside the cell. So, you know, everybody talks about the importance of fiber and that's a whole 10 podcasts in and of itself. Um, but cell walls basically you know, plants have cell walls, animals, cells don't. So basically it's, it's cellulose and we can't really break it down. So if we have a tuber that's rich in carbohydrates, the only breakdown really is going to be chewing it. And then after that, the chemical breakdown, it's there, but it's, it's not great. So we don't really liberate tons of, of these carbohydrates out of the cells. So it doesn't give the bacteria in our mouth a chance to do what they do with the dense acellular carbohydrate, which is ferment it. 
So they're very, very easily fermentable. So it's not just sugar, any fermentable carbohydrate. And guess what? All carbohydrates are fermentable, aren't they? Now there's a hierarchy, some are worse than others. So yes, you can argue that table sugar is worse than, I think it's amylopectin A is the starch in, in, um, in wheat. But um, nonetheless, you know, the stuff sticks to the teeth. So the persistence in the mouth over time is another factor to tooth decay. So you need plaque in the mouth. We all have plaque in the mouth. I don't care how much we scrape and clean and whatever. It's just going to grow back very quickly. And it's not disease causing. We, there's paleomicrobiology. They study ancient skulls and tartar um, apparently is, is already considered a fossilized material while we're alive. It's actually the only thing that fossilizes in the human body that wow. is necessarily um, causing a disease. Hmm. Uh, it generally does now be, because um, again, <coughs> fermentation, but with the paleo microbiology, they went and they took a look at the germs that were in the plaque and the tartar and more or less it was the same. Um, definitely the one, the germ P. gingivalis that causes gum disease was there in the exact same numbers, but nobody had gum disease. We know this because when you look at a skull, gum disease destroys the bone that hold the teeth in. So they had perfectly healthy um, bone structure. So what changed? It's our diets. And now the um, carbohydrates get fermented. It changes the uh, behavior of the germs and they communicate with each other. I, I kind of uh, use the analogy, you know, you have a, a class full of nice kids and somebody sneaks in some alcohol, <laughs> you know, some of, the, some, of the, some of the kids start drinking, not all of them. So some of those kids are still behaving just fine. And then you get a bunch of cutups in the class and you know, what's the difference? It was the substrate, the kids are fine. It was just a different substrate. So the other thing they do is they make lipopolysaccharides, which is a fancy way of saying toxins, endotoxins is what we call them. And they're locally destructive in the mouth. That's what causes the gingivitis. We don't see any of it. We really, it, this stuff kind of can't happen with whole foods. It just doesn't happen. Wow, interesting. So for somebody who's listening to this and saying like, yeah, I listened to my dentist. He told me not to eat sugar. So I tried you know, cutting out candy or maybe soda or something, but I'm still eating, you know, mostly plant carbohydrate sources. Why is it not okay for me to continue eating that? I, you know, I brush twice a day. I do floss my teeth. I see my dentist every six months. I do all the things that they tell me to do. Why is it so important for them to address diet when they're having some type of cleaning routine or stripping, yeah. scraping routine like you described? Yeah. So that, that's an amazing, amazing question. I, I love that. So um, I think on my um, blog, I wrote an article that might have a title, something like, I eat healthy. Why do I get cavities? I don't understand. So um, I have a, an amazing uh, group of patients. I really do. And I have people that seek me out because of kind of how I am. Um, so I think I, mine are a cut above. They, they are open to you know, things that they can do themselves to get healthier. And yet, lo and behold, they'll get a cavity or something like that. I don't understand. So we'll break their diet down. And um, I was looking at this one particular, they were, um, they threw in this, this protein powder and it was sunflower protein. And I looked at it and then I looked into how it's manufactured. And I believe what it looked like was, they took the leftover sunflower husks from the production of sunflower oil. So they were basically <laughs> using a waste product. And obviously there's protein in nuts, but there's also carbs and, and other stuff. So they were making some kind of protein powder from it, but it did have a significant amount of carbohydrate in it. It was just billed as a protein powder and you know, so you want to read the label and, and, and believe them. Um, so, I mean, I'm a big fan of turning something over and reading the label. And once it has a label, I 
don't read the label, I throw it out. <laughs> I mean, I'm being a little bit hyperbolic, but if there's a label, you really kind of have to be careful with food. If it comes in a some kind of package, you really have to be suspect. You should be able to look at food and understand what it is. An egg is an egg. Broccoli is broccoli. Even things that are a little bit more processed, I mean, we can go let's say a kind bar where they sort of press some things together this you can see some but you can kind of tell what it is by looking at it but otherwise once you start getting a bunch of ingredients it gets a little dicey out there my friend yeah, yeah totally no healthy food Are doesn't scream at you in the grocery in the, in the grocery store you know, you know the, 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 the apples and tomatoes and carrots or meat or whatever isn't screaming at you saying it's heart healthy for sure. Um, you did answer the question for sure. And I wonder if you, I kind of look at it as like a hierarchy of like, yes, I think everybody should be on a whole foods diet and let's start there. But if somebody can progress past that and eliminate more things, they might be even better off. How do you see things like fruits and vegetables in somebody's diet? Yeah, I, I have no problem with it at all because it's it's in its own delivery system. The only issue I would have is that they've been, you know, hybridized over the years. I mean, I don't think that bananas probably look like what they do now and have the sugar content that they have now. But having said that, it's still really a, a good option, in my opinion. So I'm not against fruit or anything like that. Having said that, I did a two-year experiment with the carnivore diet that was phenomenal for me. Love it. Yeah, we'll definitely be talking about that for sure. Um, I love that you mentioned the hybridized part. I, I don't think most of us realize since we've been around it for so long, our food system, like we don't give it much thought that, yeah, I can walk over to Costco and buy 12 apples that are the size of my face 365 days out of the year we don't even give that a second thought like it, they're always available and they are vastly different than what they were even 100 or 200 years ago yeah and and that's one thing i'll say to patients is that even if there was something like that that nature produces i mean we live here in the northeast so nothing's growing past october um so even if you stuffed your face with a bunch of nuts or whatever it was right um and and let's say it did have some negative effect we're gonna have to wait a year to do that again yeah. in nature right at least yeah. in the north where there's seasons so you're right um the constant availability is a, is a problem yeah. I like to point out to people, um, and I stole this from somebody, I can't remember who, but like go out into your natural environment, whatever that looks like for you and go find the food. Where's the food? Like there, it's, it's not like vegetables and fruits are just spontaneously growing in, in nature preserves or whatever. Like that, that doesn't happen. We have to raise those plants to be a certain way. Um, it's not like this food is just giving itself up to us to eat all the time. That's just, doesn't, doesn't really happen. And I, again, I, right. I don't think, I don't think many people stop to consider that because it, it has become like a normal thing that you can just go get whatever food you want from whatever corner of the globe, whenever you want, 365 days out of the year. Yeah, absolutely. And not only that, you know, when you do start processing it, of course, um, this is from Stefan Guionet. He wrote a great book. I think it was called The Hungry Brain. And he talks about how even just looking at pictures of these processed foods is enough to light up the part of your brain. You can see it on a functional MRI that drugs light up. So before you even give a conscious thought to, oh boy, that Dorito was good, your brain has already kind of had a dopamine hit yeah. and then you want to just go and do it again. And wow. it can be really difficult, more difficult for some people than others to the point where we know lots of folks that have had stomach bypasses and things like that. They just don't feel that they can say no. Yeah, and, that's right. Yeah, so... That's Gary Tobbs talks about it a little bit in the case for keto, the cephalic phase of insulin, where if you are insulin resistant and you walk past a Cinnabon, it, it, it works in the brain a lot differently than if you were somebody who's lean and insulin, insulin sensitive. And yet mm -hmm. we'll turn around and, you know, point our fingers at the obese person who is metabolically unhealthy and say, I knew you were going to eat the Cinnabon. Of course you were, you're making bad decisions. This is why you're overweight, but that those are very strong chemical mechanisms in the brain. Yeah. 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 I mean, I have a large staff and, you know, somebody will bring in donuts, bagels, whatever. <clears throat> and it's always the same people that are going back for the third and fourth little helping. And they're typically 
on the unhealthier people in the in in the practice it's yeah. a shame it's not their fault peter atia has an amazing ted talk i don't know if you've ever seen it or heard of it it's it's worth uh looking at he literally is crying on stage because he was kind of blaming his patients for their metabolic woes it's not their fault mm. And yeah, I, I don't think I've seen that TED Talk. We'll definitely link that in the show notes. That's my absolute favorite podcast. I never miss an episode of his uh, Peter Tia, the Dry Podcast. Um, so we'll definitely link up to that. Um, yeah, it is so unfortunate. I, I want to go back to the teeth. And I wonder if you can answer this question for me. I know this is something you've talked about. Why in the hell did they remove my wisdom teeth? Oh, well, um, a good question. there is, um, there are unscrupulous folks out there. So I hope that wasn't the reason. I have patients that come in and before they open their mouth, they say, I know you're going to tell me I need my wisdom teeth out. And I said, why do you, why do you say that? Because everybody tells me that. And I look in there and they're in all the way and they're functioning and the patient is capable of keeping them clean and there's no reason to remove them, but it's extremely rare. Um, the literature is all over the map kind of in terms of how many people absolutely need their wisdom teeth taken out and that would be because the jaws are not big enough most of us have small jaws and i'd love to talk about that i know i, I listen you uh you spoke to bill hang not too long ago yep. He's a legend, so i yep. know that's his message so i don't want to step in his toes but it's that's a really important thing so our jaws are too small so there's no room for the wisdom teeth to come in. When the jaws are really small, the wisdom teeth can't even break through the gums. Believe it or not, they're not as much of a problem because they're locked in the body and it's a sterile environment. And they can sometimes develop little cysts around them and they have to be removed, but that's extremely rare. When they pop through a little bit, but they can't make it in all the way, you get a flap of gum over the tooth food and plaque get under the gums and they cause infections. And then uh, there's a situation where the second molar is standing tall and the third molar, which is the wisdom tooth grows like literally sideways into it. And that little gap right here, food is packing in and, it, and it, it's sitting up against the root of the second molar and you get decay in that tooth. And then you can, so you can lose two teeth for the price of one. So um, usually once that situation arises, the teeth are taken out. I will tell you this though, I have patients that they have that situation. The wisdom tooth is kind of growing sideways. It doesn't look like it's real easy to clean, but they have an extremely clean diet, whole foods, paleo template type diet, keto, carnivore, whatever. And there's no infection, no nothing. And we watch them. I mean, this is not... I should just say that I'm not giving medical <laughs> dental advice on this podcast. Um, please go to your dentist to get an opinion. Um, but that's generally generally the reason why wisdom teeth are taken out. They're, yeah, they told me it was a precaution um, and they were trying to jump out ahead of it. But I was, I think, 26 at the time and I had all four turned into dry sockets. Um, awful experience. Oh, my goodness. Dry socket awesome. Very painful. Yeah. Horrible. Yeah, absolutely horrible. And you mentioned the jaw and we've talked about skulls already, which I think is fascinating. You talk a little bit about the shrinking face. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. Why are our skulls yes. smaller? Why are our jaws smaller? Right. So um, other than evolution of to fully modern humans, we have noticed that the face is kind of getting more upright through the stages of evolution. Um, that's happening, but that's that's a different thing. Um, so we'll put that aside. So the fully modern human being, which has been around for about 300,000 years, um, looks similar, obviously, to, to us, but you would notice they would have a much more, let's say, rugged appearance. Their jaw would be square. Um, they would have pretty good brow ridges, the forehead would actually slope back. If you looked at the profile, the face would be longer this way. And we all have the genetics to develop that way. Um, there are certain factors that play into it. Um, in my book, hard foods are a really big one. Um, there are numerous studies um, 
showing even recently uh, the rural Kentucky study is one that was done probably in the 70s by Coricini. He's a dental anthropologist. And um, when he compared the old timers to the, to the younger folks that had the processed foods, they had much more crowded teeth. Um, there are so many examples of, of that. Uh, there's one out of the University of Florence Dental School. They had old casts, you know, the models they take when you need braces. And somebody dug out the old ones from the 60s. So those kids would have been born in like the 50s, maybe early 60s. And they noticed there was much more wear on those teeth and the teeth were apparently straighter than they are now. They had less wear and they're more crooked. So the, um, it's called the functional matrix theory. That was a professor of mine at Columbia University, Melvin Moss. Um, and again, he will not take credit for this. We're always building upon you know, folks before us. But nonetheless, he described that the, the shape and the size of the jaws are dependent uh, not just on the genes, the forces, where the muscles are attached, how you use them will dictate the size and shape. So hard foods, when you put a bone uh, through its paces, I suppose if, you, if we did a study of CrossFitters that did a bunch of box, jump, jump, box jumps all the time, I bet their shin bone, their leg bones would be thicker and dense. <laughs> Absolutely. So, right. So that's the, the hard food is a huge thing for developing the jaws laterally, but also what we call sagittally front to back. Um, believe it or not, the faces are shorter when all of this happens. So with our soft food, our face actually gets longer. So that's unusual because you think of growing tall, right? You think of that's, that's a, a, a normal thing, but that's actually not. So longer, thinner, you know, shorter faces on the sagittal plane uh, are more of what we see. So, so hard food's huge. Um, breastfeeding though is breastfeeding, obviously, other than that breast milk is the perfect baby food for up to three years, which is another yep. thing. Most That's of right. us are busy that on-demand breastfeeding ends much earlier. Um, and I'm not here to, you know, tell people you know, how you're, you're terrible. You didn't, you know, on-demand breastfeed for three years. We all have to do the best we can in the modern society. It's, it's difficult. But the way that infants uh, swallow when they're born, the tongue shoots forward. It's a, it's a different type of swallowing. We're just born that way. And it helps push the bones. You know how um, there's the soft spots, Casey, when, when kids are born? The, yeah. The head, right. So yeah, yeah. all the bones of the head are not connected when we're born. And so there's one right in the middle of the palate. You can kind of feel if you with your tongue, there's like a seam. Right. And uh, there's some studies that actually show that that doesn't fully close until we're in our mid to late 60s, hmm. which is something we could talk about because adults can have their um, arches expanded. It, it does. Work. It's not too late. It's, it's not too late. Not too, it's never too late because hmm. there's a, even if it's just outright surgery, we, we can always do this. But the way that um, infants suckle, that whole mechanism and the shape of the nipple helps to spread the face out, okay? And then um, if there are any um, Sorry. anomalies, I haven't found anything in the literature. You hear about tongue ties. Have you heard of this, Casey? Yeah, I watched the video that you posted on your presentation about yeah. this. Yeah, so the little, can you see it? Yep, yep, just oh, right underneath the, the tongue. tongue. That's yep. called the frenum. And sometimes it's really short and the baby can't latch properly. And so it can be snipped in a five second laser surgery. I mean, we do it all the time for one year olds, two year olds, excuse me, one day olds, two day. Um, the back in the day, it was, it was a, a, a difficult procedure. So a lot of mothers would just, ah, you know, let's throw a bottle at the kid instead. Um, the problem is all those artificial nipples, you know, sucking fingers and thumbs, it causes uh, a suction that's incorrect and it causes the palate to literally suction and um, deform inward and get and get narrow. Um, so 
one of the things that helps develop a face is the tongue getting up on on to the palate. So if this is the the palate, right, the arch of the teeth, the tongue needs to rest on the palate in order to spread it out. If the tongue is in the floor of the mouth, once again, you don't. It's almost like an orthodontic force. You don't have that. And it, and it gets narrow. So the position of the teeth and the shape of the jaws, it, it's dependent on the muscles of the, you know, the face. If your mouth is open, uh, word is it that maybe, you know, this, this flesh here, the, the orbicularis oris is pressing in here as your mouth is open and it's narrowing the arch. So uh, proper tongue posture is a big thing. And Weston A. Price, who we love, um, it's a shame because most dentists have never heard of Weston A. Price. And yeah, I don't crazy. Know, the listeners are probably astute. So um, I'll be happy to talk if give background of Weston A. Price, but he he was on the nutrition side of it. He was big into the fat soluble vitamins, vitamin A, D, and K2. And um, especially vitamin D and vitamin K2 really help calcium get where it needs to be. So that makes sense to me entirely. Um, not a lot of supporting literature on that one. Some, I would say most uh, experts now that talk about facial development don't really bring up Weston A. Price and his nutritional theory. Of course, his book was Nutrition and Physical Degeneration. Um, he, I think he kind of missed the fact that they were chewing more coarse foods in mm. terms of their facial development, because he certainly noticed that the people eating the ancestral diets had really beautifully developed faces and arch dental arches. Um, but I, I feel that, you know, proper nutrition is absolutely a must. To what extent and can I cite that many papers? No, I, I actually can't, but um, nobody's gonna tell me that, um, you know, nutrients aren't important. No, you're absolutely right. The only thing you need to cite is Weston A. Price. That's all you really need to know and how grateful all of us should be that he, you know, did that at a time where photography was part of it. And the, the photographs are incredible. And to see those things side by side, you really yeah. get a sense that not every mouth is created the same way. And, that, you know, the, the nutrition side of things definitely would have a big part of it. Totally different. The shocking part is when he shows, especially to me, I like the Lochental Valley in Switzerland. That's the first place he went. If there's an epicenter of Europe, I think it's Switzerland. It's right in the heart of the Western world, is it not? And these people had perfectly straight teeth and only a few miles later where they had, you know, because I think they didn't have roads yet. It's a wow. very, very steep valley. Even now it's it's um, close to a wilderness. There is a road wow. in there. But, um, uh, they didn't have that. So they, you know, they had to eat what the, you know, the food they had, which I think were, you know, grazing animals, dairy and butter, all that kind of stuff. And I think they had some grains, but there were, there wasn't like there were farms everywhere because it, it was the Alps and it was a valley. So it was probably a meat animal centric type of diet. But then a few miles away, there was the same genetic stock. So that was always the argument, oh, it's genes, but no, they were the same genetic stock. And within one generation, they had these crowded mouths and long and thin faces. So this isn't evolution the way that we think of it. It's evolution in that we are supposed to be eating hard foods. We're supposed to be breastfeeding, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah, that's such a good point. I love how you mentioned the, the position of the tongue being important. That one really kind of blew my mind. And I don't know anybody who hasn't heard a million times in their life that the tongue should rest, the tongue should be down. And and like, the, I mean, just to reiterate what you said, that is absolutely not the case. The tongue needs to be up and pressing up kind of somewhere between the back of the, the, the top of the of the teeth and, and that palate, right. correct? Right. So, um, Right behind, so the upper front teeth are called the incisor. So right behind there, maybe slightly touching it up all the way across the palate. And that should be something that is looked at immediately and monitored in early life. And it's not, it's not, yeah. it should be. I mean, if it was up to me and, you know, my friends in the dental, to feel the same way 
we would try to make that happen. I, I, we were at a meeting on Wednesday, anybody who was anybody in airway dentistry, that's what this is called with the facial development was there except for Bill Hang. He was about the only one who was, <laughs> but he's got California and Vermont. So we get it. Um, and I think that in Brazil, it, it's mandatory that they check the baby for a tongue tie before wow. they leave the hospital. But wow. it's not mandatory in this country. I think it's done a lot, but it really, it should be one of those things like the APGAR, you know, the one they test the reflex. It should just be done yeah. immediately. Um, but moder so, you know, oh, how cute Junior is snoring. And it's not cute. The sleep doctor that I use, I I send dozens of people for sleep tests. It's it's really a, taking a terrible toll. This stuff, the small faces lead to apneas and not breathing and not sleeping, and it's awful. Um, but the sleep doctor that I use, the one that kind of runs the whole uh, rest of them, he will say that all snoring will turn into an apnea. Wow. I'm not he's saying that he's the sleep expert so that's kind of shocking so children should not be snoring at all that's a huge sign that their face is too small and it's beneficial to correct the growth early it's much easier to do because the face is growing and changing rapidly but sadly it's kind of done growing by about 10 years of age and that's another hard thing for people to wrap their brains around because you know we hit our growth spurts right in seventh eighth ninth grade and we're growing up but we pretty much already finished growing our heads and our faces we'll, we'll say 10 to 17 or 18 but really mostly by 10 years of age that's that so if you see on a child that has teeth that you don't see little spaces between their primary teeth their baby teeth you got trouble already. If their teeth are touching like ours are, that's already an indication that the jaws are too small and it does not self-correct. Wow, it, I didn't know that. You mentioned, and it could be finding out if they have a tongue tie, it could be tonsils and adenoids. If they can't breathe through their nose, they're gonna sleep like this all night. Yeah, right? yeah. So yeah, uh, Interesting. treating the younger, the better. Three years mm -hmm. of age is not, too young. Uh, my friend Kevin Boyd, who's probably the, one of the premier uh, pediatric sleep dentists in, in the world, but certainly in America, he practices out of Chicago. He exclusively has a pediatric airway practice and he calls eight year olds geriatric patients. Wow. 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 So yeah. interesting. Wow. But, um, but I it's was not too late. It's not too late. We can still treat beyond that. It becomes sure. a little bit more difficult harder yeah that makes sense i was able to spend a few years down in brazil and i remember in the few in the rural areas that we would be in um it, it was a little weird at first culturally but kids would come up to their moms up to ages three four five and ask to eat and it would just be no problem and i, I also vaguely remember the mom would would kind of close the mouth of the baby if the kid was sleeping or something they would try to keep that closed we've been fortunate enough to um interview both james nestor who i know you absolutely adore and uh Patrick you were with him on uh on Wednesday, yeah. Oh, yeah. amazing. I'm, uh, I'm supposed to be on a panel with him at UCLA at the Ancestral Health Symposium in August. Awesome. So, yeah, That's he's a, amazing. His book has done wonders for airway dentistry. Yeah. 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 Totally. I'm sorry, but, go ahead. No, no, no. It was really influential in the way that a lot of people looked at these things and specifically breathing. Can you talk about um, why it's so important to keep the mouth closed and to, to teach people how to breathe properly through the nose? Yeah. So, um, and, and James Nestor talks about this in his book, Breath. It's an amazing book. I recommend it to everybody. Um, in here in Connecticut, we have a, the oldest law school in the country in, in a, a little cute little New England town called Litchfield. And it's called the Tapping Reeve Law School. So this kid from uh, Pennsylvania, uh, I think he was out on the Western aspects of Pennsylvania. So uh, this would have been the late 1700s, early 1800s he would still see Native Americans in sort of their, you know, natural state. And, and he felt bad for them, you know, they were kind of getting chased out of the area, et cetera. 
So he decided after law school, because he was a talented painter, he would go and paint them. So he went out west in the early 1800s, and he was well accepted because it was like magic. They had never seen anybody do this. And he noticed the magnificent faces they had. And lo and behold, they had a tradition of making sure their children kept their mouths closed if they weren't talking or eating. And in 1862, he published a book exactly about that. Was it his idea? No. And it, you know, it came from the Native Americans, but how many tens of thousands of years old was that tradition? So it's funny, we're sitting here thinking we're figuring stuff out. When again, this is why I kind of like this ancestral approach to health. What were our ancestors doing to develop, you know, to be happy and healthy and robust and vital? I think that's a big part of the puzzle that's missing today that we really need to get back. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. We look back and think they were barbarians <laughs> when they had bigger brains, they were healthier. They had better bones. Their teeth were better. Like bigger arguably, everything was better about their lifestyle. They didn't yeah. have iPhones, maybe just lacking that. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe the iPhone's a little overrated sometimes. Perhaps. <laughs> maybe it is. Yeah. Maybe it is. Yeah. yeah Cause no, I mean, with our, my, so we're, I'm 60. Don is much younger, but, um, you know, when we were kids, honestly, we were roaming around the neighborhood. I was three years old. Yep. My parents today would be considered criminals. Totally. I was falling in the mud. I was doing whatever. And did we get into trouble? And I don't mean trouble like, you know, um, killing the neighbor's cat or anything like that. Um, I can remember there was a construction site. The, there was nobody there and um you know it was all dug up and and it had rained so there's mud everywhere and i rode my a few miles from the home and i stepped in mud and it sucked my sneaker off i had no sneaker <laughs> so you know all my friends were making fun of me and i felt shame oh my god and i rode home and i just i didn't even i didn't even think i told my parents i was embarrassed i learned my lesson that's that and that's that was a different world that, you know, you you learn by being with your peers. And I'm sad to say there probably obviously there was a certain amount of ridicule and there was a certain amount of risk. Um, but it was it was just different times. You learn yeah. from the school of hard knocks. Yep. Yeah. With my kids. Well, I should say my kids, kids today. Um, they don't know stuff like basics yeah. because they don't have to. They'll just pull this thing up. That's right. You find out, you know. At the at the eleventh hour. <clears throat> yep. Well yeah. No, I I love the concept of hard now, easy later, or an easy now, hard later. Like if you have an easy life, one day you're going to be an adult and you're going to figure out how credit cards work and what a mortgage is and all these things are going to slam into you. And if you hadn't gone through those stages of learning, it's going to be much much harder. I would I would submit for sure. I um, tell that to my staff all the time. Let's do the hard thing today, you know, learning all this new stuff and the technologies that come along with it, yep. but yep. easy tomorrow. Yeah. That's yep. a great thing, Casey. Mm -hmm. um, I, I guess this is a question probably for both of you, but in your own, you know, not, not only your own dental hygiene practice, but also what you recommend for other people. Can you maybe give us kind of a hierarchy of the things that we should really prioritize above others? Obviously diet should be up there. It could be more of the traditional things like, yes, you should definitely brush your teeth and floss, or it could be, you know, we recommend mouth taping or we recommend red light therapy, or what are some of the, the uh, biggest things that most people may or may not even know about that can really benefit them at the, the maximal way? So the basics are, Certainly it's diet. And if we had to look, you know, there's, there's a certain, a few um, bad players um, like the industrial seed oils are not great. So of course they're going to promote inflammation, but we're, we're looking at just gum disease. Then we, again, we have to be talking these dense acellular carbohydrates to minimize them as best you can. Dense acellular carbohydrates, I guess would equate to processed carbs for the average person. Um, so that's huge. If we can eat a whole foods diet, I don't care what you call your diet. It could be vegan, it could, whatever it is. If it consists of whole foods, you're going to be a lot better off. Um, I like the concept of brushing and flossing because ooh, 
otherwise, I mean, I suppose we don't have to wash and comb our hair. It's not going to lead to disease, but it's kind of gross. So I think brushing, but nobody did that when they were eating, you know, the, the quintessential paleo diet. I don't think there was a lot of personal oral hygiene. Um, I don't think that toothpaste is really necessary at all. Um, having said that, um, it feels good. It, it feels like, you know, you have something in there and it's kind of foaming away the, um, the stuff that you're brushing off your teeth. So I'm not, against, it, I mean, it's not necessary. I'm not against it. Mm. Use it fine. Uh, on my website, I, I think I had a couple of recipe. do it yourself. Uh, oh, great. Coconut oil, MCT oil is good. The coconut oil in up here in the Northeast, it gets hard in the winter. <laughs> it's too cold, you know, in your, in your medicine cabinet, but the MCT, which is that liquid coconut oil, um, you know, you can mix up your own oil pulling. I have an article that um, surprisingly or unsurprisingly, I say unsurprisingly, that oil pulling, there are lots of studies that show that oil pulling does work. Now, the it's way to say to do it for, for your listeners who aren't familiar, you're supposed to take any kind of oil, not motor oil, you know, edible oil. And um, so expensive I, anyway. I think 20 minutes. I don't know about yeah, you, 20 minutes. I mean, I don't even like to work out for more than 20 minutes sometimes. When, you know, it's a Agreed. lot of time. So I like the concept of oil pulling, but if I ever do it, it's for minutes. It's for minutes, but I think it done correctly. It's supposed to be for a long time. Um, the other big thing is smoking. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the two big things that I tell patients are the diet and smoking. Um, the jury is out on vaping because that doesn't really contain the tars and the harmful things. I mean, I personally, my opinion is don't vape. I don't know yeah. what's in that stuff with the, I mean, I smell it. It smells like vanilla, strawberry. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but it feels like, it feels like one of those things that like in 10 years, we'll be like, yeah, that was really dumb. Did all these things. Yeah. So if the mouth is dry, so you, you mentioned mouth tape, if you're dry. So first of all, that's not normal. That shouldn't be normal. So be alarmed if, if your mouth is dry and yes, a really quick thing is mouth tape. It doesn't have to be mouth tape. It shouldn't be duct tape. You can go to CVS or whatever, any major pharmacy or probably minor pharmacy for that matter, and get the kind of like cloth tape that, you know, that you, that's meant to be put on skin. Yeah. And um, you can, and it doesn't have to be, you know, a big, it can just be a couple of, yeah, like here, something like that, um, where you can have a drink of water at night. But if you're thirsty, if, you, if your mouth is dry, it changes the environment in the mouth different germs grow. Um, my patients uh, that I see that the gums right on the top front teeth are all red, right around the margin. Um, people can do this at home, just smile at yourself. And if you have, see a red rim of gums on your front, let's say six teeth, and probably mouth breathing. Um, and the other thing is that the saliva is the immune system of the mouth. Yeah. So if you're sleeping with your mouth open, the mouth is drying, you're really kind of inactivating the immune system of the mouth. The saliva will put minerals back into the teeth. So if we have something like coffee or kombucha, um, it's a sip, <laughs> and it will melt the minerals out of your teeth. Um, but, um, you know, so I don't like to sip the kombucha over time because the formula for tooth decay is germs. We started talking about it before. Um, the carbs plus time. And, and then you throw frequency in there, okay? So somebody sipping a sugared coffee, you know, all day long, every minute for yeah. five hours. Not good. Not good. Um, so, you know, get it in there quick. The saliva will replenish the minerals in the teeth, whatever was lost from the, from the acid. And then there's a balance. So it's only when you have a net loss, when you dissolve the, the minerals in the teeth, you get a hole. That's what a cavity is. And a cavity is not the germs eating the teeth, it's the germs eating the carbs, fermenting acids, that's the, the end result, and it leaches out the minerals in the teeth. And germs like the, um, you know, form colonies, you know, like a herd, 
or, yeah. or a school of fish. So they concentrate in one area, like in the nooks and crannies of the teeth or by the gum line. And then once enough mineral is lost, you get, you get a hole. So try to minimize the carbs. Um, if you have a dry mouth, see your dentist. I mean, this is something, but yes, mouth tape for sure. Don't smoke not a big fan of vaping to be quite honest with you and then there's a lot of medications as people get older they go on these high blood pressure medications and they're like diuretics and they dry us up and that can cause an increased um, risk for for tooth decay brushing and flossing like i said um i tell my patients all the time if you eat a perfect diet you probably don't really have to do it um, that's kind of strange coming from a dentist, I would say. You've never putting yourself out of business. Well, I, that's actually what I'm trying to do because this stuff gets really expensive. You know, four was everybody has four wisdom teeth taken out or 90%. Whenever I give a lecture and everybody raises their hand when I ask them who's had wisdom tooth problems, it's pretty much the whole audience. Yeah. So crooked teeth, that's thousands and thousands of dollars. And then your cavities and your root canal. It's just, who has this kind of money anymore? Yeah. No? Yeah. So if we can help people, you and I and Donna, help themselves, I think that's the way to go. What I tell patients is um, we see them for a cleaning twice a year. We spend an hour. The average patient goes twice a year. Some people go more. And obviously, there are a lot of people that are don't go at all. But the average patient would come for two hours a year. That leaves 8,758 hours that it's up to the individual to not get a cavity. So if yeah. me to say, oh, yes, I'm the one who stopped you from getting gum disease in a cavity. Really? I don't think so. Two hours a year. That wasn't me. That was the patient. Mm -hmm. So it really is up to the patient. But the first thing I say to all my patients, and I, and it's also the last thing I say it all the time is, I work for them. They're my boss. My patients are actually, as a matter of fact, they're the boss of everybody who works in my office. We don't tell them what to do. We help them. We're their advocate. We're not going to do anything they don't want us to do. We're here to make suggestions, but it's up to them to carry away with you know what they want to do. And I will never judge any of my patients or really anybody for what they do or they don't do. That's their own business. It's I love that. Wow. I love that. Now, I just, I think it's wonderful what you're doing, you know, not pushing that on people, but also you are planting a seed and it comes from somebody who, you know, as, as not a doctor, not a dentist, we respect you. We, we look up to you. We, we trust your advice. You know, or if I'm sitting on the other side of somebody with a white coat, I'm going to have that level of like respect for what that person is saying. And, and doctors, very few doctors and no dentists that I know personally have ever talked about any of this stuff. And it would have been really helpful to learn. And, you know, right. I think it is, it is up to the individual to take action and take ownership of their own lives. And the good news is there's stuff like this that's out there. It's 2022. You can go find all this information. You don't need to go to college. Nobody has a monopoly on yeah. the information. It is out there. You have to go find it, but you can find it. If you care about your health, you'll take the steps and take care of yourself. That's what I like about this. There we go. Because as a medical healthcare practitioner, it's going to keep us on our toes. People are going to come in and they're, they're going to know a lot about the subject matter that brought them in, whether it's teeth or, or whatever. And I love it. And, and you know, I, I get something out of researching my blogs. I try to do them once a week um, because I'm constantly renewing what I, you know, the, the, the literature out there, right? It's always changing. So um as having a scientific kind of mind, I mean, I'm a clinician more than I'm a scientist for sure. But what I think is the truth today, we don't, nobody ever knows the truth. We're just as close as we can get for now. But if something comes out that refutes it, then I have to change my mind. I can't cry over it. Too many scientists get so attached to their little theory and it's not going to help anybody to cling to the theory and ridicule somebody else who might have a different way of looking at things. That's right. It's not going to bring us forward. It's just That's not. Right. And that we've seen a lot of that lately with the pandemic and the, not to get into that, but I think we've seen that medicine 
you know, these doctors are good people. They want to help, but they can't sometimes. They're not allowed to give a medicine. They're not allowed to say something. I mean, I think you know Sean Baker, right? Yeah, of course. Yep. So what happened to him? He was trying to tell people, why don't you lose weight and eat better? And he was their best surgeon and they didn't want any part of that. And they yeah. went after him. Yep, that's yeah. right. That's so right. The, the, the corporate end of it, the, the insurance end of it, and unfortunately now the political, you know, politicians are trying to tell us what medicines we shouldn't should. It's getting a little dicey out there. So yeah, we we need to respect each other and let patients make their own choice. So I I think informed consent is something that's really, really, really lacking in medicine. Um, I had a situation maybe now going on a year and a half ago where my shoulder was blazingly uncomfortable for two or three days. It went away, but I had a little bit of tingling and numbness. So I went to uh, orthopedic practice and they took an x-ray and they said, oh yeah, you know, your neck is arthritic, this, that, and the other thing, go do uh, rehab. So I did that. And um, I didn't feel any different. Not, I didn't, I didn't feel bad though. I had really no issue. Um, so I went back after the, the three months and they took a, an MRI and they said, oh my goodness, you need surgery. So then they, he referred me to his partner, the surgeon who walked in and was already gung ho for the surgeon, never asked me whether, what, what I thought, sent me for a CAT scan because you know he had to look at the bones of my spine to see whether he was gonna do a disc replacement or a fusion. Um, you get these bony outgrowths in your spine and that would ruin having a fusion. It's like they, you need like flat surface, whatever. So in the meanwhile, I'm doing my, my research and lo and behold, if you're a 60 year old man and somebody takes any kind of an image of your neck, there's about a 95% chance they're going to find something that looks like it needs surgery. Mm. Yikes. Okay. Yeah. Then the Lancet did a meta analysis of it. A uh, fusion, spinal fusion. At this point, I wasn't sure. Uh, to me, a disc replacement sounded better. Not that I wanted anything, because I, I, I mean, I didn't feel bad. I would. There's no pain, nothing. No limited range of motion, nothing. Um, so they did a meta analysis, and the conclusion was that spinal fusions um, are no better, and a lot of times worse than minimally invasive or non-invasive approaches. And wow. then they editorialized in that that um, edition of the Lancet um, that spinal fusion should all be off the table as a modality. Wow! Because it's no better than wow. anything else that's less invasive. So I walked into the surgeon. They, I thought I was going to read the CAT scan prior to, well, at least his plans to do surgery on me. And a technician walked in and took two said they wanted to take two more x-rays at that point i said time out this is all going a little too fast for me long story short the surgeon was mad he spoke down his nose to me he said something like nobody dragged you off the street you know because I, I, I literally my question was why do you want to do surgery what are the parent what are you looking at that leads you to and he didn't he didn't come up with a, any great idea he just assumed i was going to listen to him um, but the real informed consent, the legal informed consent would have been, you know, oh, I better listen to him. He's got a white coat on. My fanny would have been hanging out a surgical gown. I would have been three feet from the surgical table. They would have handed me a clipboard to sign that they could make me paralyzed and kill me. Is that informed consent, Casey? I don't think yeah. so. Wow. So they need to give you a packet, read this, look at this and get back to me. Mm -hmm. yeah. And this guy was mad that I would even question why he would you know, want to do this. So, so frustrating. To me, informed consent is like a real, real issue. It's not about signing something two minute, you know, your wisdom tooth is infected and the guy wants to pull it here, sign this. That's not good enough in my opinion. Sometimes yeah. there are emergencies, right. I get it, but you really, everybody needs to do their homework, back off a little bit and, the patient let the patient have the final say as to what they 
want to do. I love that. That should be so obvious to everybody. And it's unfortunate that it's not, but I love your approach now. You're trying to bring that out. You did mention Sean Baker um, and I interviewed him on this show and told him to his face that I still have not finished the episode that he did on Joe Rogan. When I first heard about the carnivore diet, I said, this is absolutely preposterous. This, this guy is no chance you can eat meat and be healthy. I turned it off. I have been pretty much 100% carnivore for the last three years after trying it for 30 days. I kind of forgot to stop. Um, I'm a coach for his company. <laughs> I know. I that. So funny. I'm uh, very excited about that. That's something that I would consider actually myself. Nice. I love it. it. So speaking of, you know, um, orthopedic problems, uh, as a dentist, the left hand just kind of sits there and holds a skinny little mirror times 33 years, right? So I had wow. two since I was a clicking thumb, okay? Oh, Five, yeah. Five years of that. Six years, I even have a scar. Um, golfer's elbow, I don't play golf, but just locked in, you know, the tendons tight. It was painful. Six years, I had injections. I had, I had surgery. The surgery did nothing. So I saw Sean Baker live at Paleo FX. And same thing, I, I think I was, it really opened up my curiosity and knowing what I know uh, from the ancestral community, I, I really like um, Mickey Bendor. He, he would be a good guy, I don't know if you know phenomenal. him. We've had him, we've had him, he's yeah, phenomenal. He's awesome. Brilliant. He, I love him. Um, so it, it was very, very plausible to me that we probably had an animal-based diet. I had nothing to lose. Donna and I went back and forth for, probably a year or two. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, January 1st, I said, I'm doing it. It was a couple of years ago, about two and a half years ago now. Yeah. And within three weeks, mm -hmm. the elbow was better. It's never hurt. My workouts went through the roof, my energy level, my body composition, my ability to concentrate my sleep. I, I, not, I can't say enough good things about it. That's this amazing. Is I'm not saying it's for everybody. Then my thumb, I could tell it was getting better within a few weeks, but that did take about eight months to finally go away, but still. Wow. I think like the bad. sleep thing was the thing that changed com quickly and completely mm -hmm. for you. I mean, um, it really. That's really amazing. So and I will tell you, that's a great diet for your mouth. Yeah, mm -hmm. I could not agree more. I've never spent less time taking care of my mouth than I do now on a carnivore diet. And then my teeth feel as strong and healthy as they always have been. Donna, is this something that you eat as well? Are you primarily a carnivore? So um, I guess I'm primarily a carnivore, but um, I, I, I hope this is okay. I feel like it's a little boring for me to just, oh, totally fine. Uh, and it's certainly easier for me to kind of help Scott and, and kind of people get so thrown off by the whole concept of it. But generally speaking, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I love, I love eating meat and, um, but I, I like to mix it up a little bit with a little bit more veggies and things like that. So Casey, do you have a trick um, preparing foods or whatever? I sous vide a bunch of stuff at the mm -hmm. beginning of the week. And that's that. And same. We're so easy, dude. Like, like to, for, for me. Yeah. It's same. It's like, it's really a, few, like <laughs> a few steaks or ground beef. Like I, I'm, I guess I'm fortunate. I, I never get sick. I don't get palate fatigue. Somebody was just asking me, how do you not get sick of the same things? It's like, you really, you really don't. And it's nice too, Donna, knowing that about yourself, you might get sick of certain things, but having a small amount of plant foods, I certainly don't think that's a terrible idea, especially if you've done carnivore for a minute and kind of reduced the inflammation. I, I just think there's way too much of that processed crap that so many people are eating. Like if fruits and vegetables, nothing, probably not. <laughs> if nothing else, it's like an amazing elimination diet, in my opinion, for the reason that really most of the, most animal flesh, it just doesn't, it mm -hmm. doesn't have poisons like, you know, plants yep. do. Um, so I, I, I just find it, it's, it's great. So I've gone off of it, but I mean, I, I think I had some raspberries today with my cottage cheese Great, and that'll be my vegetation for the day. That's great. I love yeah. that. I love Scott Mislinski's um, way of defining, I don't know where he got this from, but saying like a hyper carnivore is somebody who eats at least 75% of their calories from animal products. And I think that is a wonderful definition and allows some wiggle room for people to include other things and not get too dogmatic. So that's great. Um, it, I it did want to mention uh, real Please. quick, I'm sorry to interrupt, because you mentioned about, um, you know, a hankering for, for something else. Um, after a year, I ran extensive uh, tests and um, of course, they tell you that your, you know, the short chain fatty acids that they're supposed to find in your colon 
if you look on if you just google that right now on the internet it'll say it comes from fiber it comes from fiber it comes from fi that's you won't find anything else but when you look at the literature um it comes from protein mm -hmm. i had extra high levels of one of them. there's three of them propionate i think that's how you pronounce it um was was high so then i started looking i said uh oh it's high it's it's above you know what it should be i better look at the literature and see what that means for me well it doesn't mean anything it's a great thing but what i found this is interesting it affects the part of the brain it down regulate and they found this from a functional mri it affects the part of the brain um that makes you have cravings because i do not crave food. I think I was keto for a long time, but I certainly I had cravings. At some point, I'd be wanting to do a gluten-free pizza or whatever. There's none of that. So I don't know if that's the answer, but there is literature out there that you will ferment the protein into short-chain fatty acids. This particular one, I think it's called pronounced propionate, um, affects the brain and yeah. dulls your cravings. Kind of cool. Yeah. That's way cool. I, it's it's such a shame that such a small percentage of the population would even know what the hell you're talking about when you're saying you have no sugar cravings to be able to, like, you take it for granted. You can walk through anywhere, any party, any grocery store. You go right to the area where your food is. You can pass all these other things that people think look delicious. They, they have zero effect. It, it could be, you know, cans of paint for all I care. Like, it, it doesn't matter anymore. And I just think so few people even know what that's like. And that's such a freeing a wonderful thing and i wish more people would, would try you know very low carbohydrate or carnivore diet at least for a little while to see what that's like yeah, yeah. funny thing casey i uh i'm always recommending to my patients to use like a my fitness pal or something but i had never done it up until i don't know four or five years ago i could give this advice and look at me i never i'm like so shouldn't i try it so i started doing it, i went holy moly i'm like zero i'm like extremely keto i had no idea i just ate the way i wanted to eat i never gave what <laughs> and I, I was keto so that's great the thing is if you're keto i guess it's a short step away to be carnivore is it not it's an totally. easy step yep yeah, yeah. Totally, totally agree right. totally agree and so many people find it that way they go paleo and then they go you know low carb keto and eventually try carnivore yeah. this has been such an amazing conversation you guys where do you want people to go to find you and connect with you and your work so um, I have a uh, blog that I, I try to do once a week. It's called drscottsolomons.com. Sorry, say that one more time. I cut you off. drscottsolomons.com. So DR. So good. Yes, DR. drscottsolomons.com. So yep. um, my practice is very large. My mission in life, we didn't get into the face stuff so much, but in the airway, but uh, it's it's growing. It's growing. I probably... I think I have 70 dentists. Wow. And we need them all looking at this stuff. All the stuff we talked about. I need to get to them, to talk to them, look at how people swallow, look at how people breathe, all of this stuff. So that's dentalassociates.us. Way back when the internet was young, back in the Wild West days, somebody had already taken the dot com. And that's and hilarious. Anyway, it wasn't like we were going to have a website, but we're like, we better register that. It was years. I mean, this we're talking a long time ago. And somebody had already taken it. So we're dot us. Awesome. So I mean, and I know I have Instagram and Facebook. I think I'm Dr. Scott at, Solomon. At Donna Dr. would know. At she, Dr. Scott Solomon. There you go. So it's all awesome. O's, S O L O M O N S. Okay, perfect. That's great. We will link to all of that in the show notes. Uh, thank you so much to both of you. Thank you for all your research. Thank you for taking thank the time. With you guys. Absolutely. Thanks for hanging out, Donna. Uh, besides, <laughs> the, besides the Rangers comment, we're okay. We're good. Um, but, but honestly, can I, uh, Case, can I just say one thing? Of course. Um, of all of the stuff that we spoke about today, I mean, the number one predictor of a long happy, healthy life are the people that you surround yourself with that are the good folks, not the ones that are on you for stuff. And so 
the, right now, if the number one thing that makes me healthy is Donna and my family oh, and friends and guys like you that are open to conversations that we can connect to, that just jazzes me. That is the most important thing. Wow. We well, get along and communicate. I absolutely love that. You definitely earned brownie points from me, and I'm sure you did from Donna as well. <laughs> Thank you. I couldn't agree more. Um, thank and thank you both so much for hanging out with us today and teaching us in, in such a great practical and educational way. We're really appreciative of both of you. And thanks for joining us on our episode today. Thank really you. enjoyed it, Casey. Say hi to Beth. Yeah, absolutely. I will Say for hi. sure. Bye. And this has been another episode of Balanced Body Radio.